Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece at Central New Mexico Community College. This is video B, our last video on the joints. It's a pretty short chapter. We don't really go into the detailed gross anatomy, which we tend to keep for our labs. Um, but in this video, we're, we're going to focus more on the synovial joints, the diarthrotic joints that we call synovial joints that are the most common in the body. And then a very brief uh, section towards the very end of this video focuses on the most common form of arthritis, which we call osteoarthritis. What sets our synovial joints apart from the other structural class, classes of joints which were your fibrous joints and your cartilaginous joints, is that all synovial joints, they contain a fluid-filled joint cavity. We can often better refer to this as the synovial cavity. And because there is this cavity present filled with that fluid, these joints are very movable, so if we classify them functionally, we would say that they are diarthrotic. Now, being extremely mobile, unfortunately, has a consequence, and that is that these are the least stable joints. If you think about it, sutures are very, very stable, right? Those bones can budge, cannot budge, but synovial, synovial joints are extremely mobile, and therefore, they're constantly threatened by um, going by the bones possibly uh, going out of the joint. And so, therefore, there are some things that can improve stability. And I'll start with uh, the bottom two bullets here. So clearly, ligaments, which of course are the dense connective tissues that interconnect our bones they connect one bone to another, ligaments are going to hold our bones in place, our bones in place in the synovial joint. Also, how well the articular surfaces fit together. So, for instance, if you have, let's say, this bone here and this bone here, notice that their surfaces here where they meet, they're two very flat surfaces, so the chances for let's say this top bone to possibly slide out of the joint are very high. Now compare that to this scenario where one bone has an articular surface that's very, that has a nice cavity in it kind of like that, such that the other bone has a surface that is kind of more rounded like the head of the femur and can nicely fit in there. So that head is not easily going to slip out of that joint because it's, it's hugged by the cavity of the other bone. So this is stabler, or more stable, I should, stay, should say, and this one is less stable. They're both synovial joints, but their articular surfaces differ, and therefore that's going to impact on how stable they are. The most important factor, the most important factor for stability in synovial joints, on the other hand, is muscle tone. So muscle tone is what makes our joints, our synovial joints, the most stable. So both these are really saying the same thing, so we can actually just delete the second bullet. And so what do we mean by muscle tone? Well, we'll learn in much greater deta detail what it is when we get to the muscle chapter, but for now, please accept the fact that even when you're not actively using a particular muscle, let's say you're sitting in your chair watching TV, your arms might be totally relaxed, your feet, your legs might be totally relaxed, you're not really actively using any of those muscles unless you're wiggling your toes or so, but the muscles in your limbs, the muscles in your fingers are still ever so slightly contracted. We might not be totally aware of it, but our central nervous system is constantly communicating with those muscles to keep them ever so slightly contracted. And that ever so slightly contracted state we call muscle tone. And that slightly contracted state keeps tugging on the tendons and keeps them tight such that 
it's much more difficult for the tendons, which of course are connecting our muscle to our bone. So for instance, let's say here's a muscle on our, on our bone and its tendon, I'll draw it in the green, grabs onto the, this bone down here. You know, if we have some contraction in this red muscle, it's going to keep this green tendon tight and once again, that keeps our joint stable. This is the most important stabilizing factor, muscle tone, because of how it keeps the tendons taut or tight at all times. And there's another advantage to expressing good muscle tone, and that is that it allows us to react much faster to a stimulus. Of course, most of our joints are synovial joints. Most of our joints are freely movable. A synovial joint is characterized by particular anatomical structures. For one, we have to have a synovial cavity. So this right here is our synovial cavity or the joint cavity, as you see labeled here. And that is filled with a fluid we call synovial fluid. We'll talk more about that fluid in just a moment. You're already familiar with the articular cartilage. So even though the articular cartilage we considered part of our bone organ, it also is considered to be part of our joint. Where the articular cartilage is not present around the synovial cavity, we're going to have a membrane so-called synovial membrane, which is going to be made up of fibers and uh, various cells that are going to be responsible for creating the synovial fluid from our blood plasma. Remember that most bodily fluids, if not all actually I should say, arise from our blood somehow or another. Finally, interconnecting one bone with the other we have ligaments sitting directly on top of our synovial membrane, and we refer to these ligaments as our articular capsule. So these are the typical structures that you find in a synovial joint. I have listed here reinforcing ligaments, so what that means is that very often, in addition to your typical articular cartilage, I'm, see, I'm sorry, articular capsule, you might also have additional uh, ligaments perhaps interconnecting this portion of this bone to that portion, um, or maybe even within, like we see in the, in the, in the a knee joint, inside of the joint cavity, uh, we might see crossing over ligaments like so. So the synovial membrane that we see uh, surrounding the synovial cavity, except where there is the articular cartilage, is a two-layered membrane. And we have an outer layer that has fibers in it. It's, it's, it can be less fibrous, um, but it definitely has some fibers in it. Uh, it can be as delicate as areolar connective tissue. And then the inner layer is made up of a bunch of very scattered uh, cells, including fibroblasts that, of course, make the fibers. All right, let me make sure I put the right arrow there. So they make the fibers and then macrophages. And these cells are going to also help with not just defending us against pathogens, but they're also involved in the making of the synovial fluid. The synovial membrane is very vascularized and the capillaries that bring in the blood are going to be um, playing a role in the making of our synovial fluid. So let's discuss the synovial fluid. Let's first take a look at what it's made up of. First of all, it has this egg white-like consistency and it contains something called hyaluronin or hyaluronic acid. More often than not, you really see it being called hyaluronic acid. This is very typical for synovial fluid. And this is a secretion from the fibroblasts. This is mixed by 
a secretion produced by the chondrocytes, that's the cartilage cells, from the articular cartilage. And then in addition to that, and most of the fluid is really just filtered blood plasma. So all of these things, all of these three things, form our synovial fluid. So what is the function of that fluid? Well, like any joint, whether it's in a living organism or not, let's say in a car, um, in your bike, it doesn't matter. Joints need to remain lubricated in order to function properly. And so this synovial fluid does that. It allows for good lubrication uh, such that there's a reduction in friction. As a matter of fact, when we're not using our joints, some of that synovial fluid is absorbed by the chondrocytes. So when we're not using our joints, the chondrocytes sort of retake, reabsorb the synovial fluid. When we then later on start to use our joints again, then the synovial fluid will start to seep out of or to weep out, from there the term weeping lubrication, um, out of the articular cartilage to help lubricate the joints more. So when we use our joints, we see weeping lubrication occurring. Now, when the um, chondrocytes reabsorb that synovial fluid, they can take advantage of some of the nutrients in that synovial fluid as well, and they can get rid of their waste. So the synovial fluid provides nutrients and allows for the removal of wastes for the chondrocytes. It's a fluid, so it also provides shock absorption. The macrophages can phagocytize any kinds of pathogens, dead cells. And then we also see that it functions, the synovial fluid functions as a molecular sieve. So the hyaluronic acid in the synovial fluid presses up against the synovial membrane. So the, the hyaluronic acid in the fluid presses up against the synovial membrane. And that makes it much more difficult for any kinds of cells or pathogens to move in or out of that synovial cavity. Now earlier when I introduced you to the typical anatomy of a synovial joint, I mentioned that we might see all kinds of additional ligaments, uh, especially in the knee joint but we can actually see all kinds of additional structures as well. And the knee joint is once again a really great example to go to because that's where we see little pads of fibrocartilage that help with shock absorption and you know that they're called menisci. Sometimes they're small and then we call them articular discs. Um, we might see them in, in other areas. There might be fatty pads that again help cushion and then there's two structures that are filled with synovial fluid. One is called a bursa, which literally means a uh, little purse, or bursa means purse. So it's a little purse-like structure, sac-like structure, that is filled with the synovial fluid. And that's going to typically sit uh, in between a hard spot and a soft spot. And you'll see on the diagram here in just a moment what I mean by that. And similar principle with the tendon sheath, except that it's not sac-like, it's more like um, a wrapping uh, around a tendon. So let's take a look at uh, some pictures to better understand these two last structures in particular. So here we're looking at a mid-sagittal view of our knee, right? It's as if we've sliced uh, through the mid part sagittally to create this mid-sagittal plane. And here you can actually see our femur with its articular cartilage. Let's just go over the basic anatomy first. Here's the tibia with its articular cartilage. Here we see the patella with its articular cartilage. And then here we see the quadriceps femoris muscle group. This is as the name says, quadriceps, four muscles that all merge and create one tendon. That tendon will grab onto our patella and then continue to grab onto our um, tibia. 
So the, the structure that interconnects the biceps, I'm sorry, the quadriceps femoris with the patella is referred to as the quadriceps femoris tendon. So that's the structure right here, right? The structure right here is the tendon of the quadriceps femoris muscle. But then, as I said, it continues and grabs onto here from the patella to the tibia. And so this right here, actually they've labeled it here, this structure right here, that is going to be our patellar ligament. Sometimes people call this incorrectly the patellar tendon. If you look at what this structure does, it interconnects the patella with the tibia and therefore by definition we should call it a ligament. Notice that there are additional ligaments um, interconnecting our bones. For instance, here we see this ligament here. We even see uh, ligaments on the inside of the, the cavity, the joint cavity that cross over. You might have heard of people injuring or tearing their ACL. That is the anterior cruciate ligament, cruciate referring to crossing over. And this one right here is called the posterior cruciate ligament right here. It sits posterior to the ACL. So sometimes people tear their PCL. More often than not, it's the ACL they damage. Okay, so some of the additional structures that we come across in synovial joints, as we listed earlier, might be some fatty pads like shown here. Um, including menisci, which we're going to see better on the next picture. Um, and then the so-called bursi. Remember the bursi or bursa singular are sac-like structures. Here they are. Here's one. Uh, here's another one. Oops, not that one. This one in the gray here. Yep which is called the infrapatellar bursa. I don't need you to know the specific names of these bursae and other structures, but there's plenty of bursae labeled here. So these are all filled with synovial fluid. And notice where uh, many of them sit. They're going to sit in between something softer, such as a ligament, and hard, such as our bone. Same here. Here we have uh, a bursa that sits between a hard bone, the patella, and um, some ligaments here that interconnect our bones. And here we see a bursa again that separates a hard spot from a softer spot. So that's what the bursae do. Now tendon sheets do something very similar. They're again going to sit between a hard and a softer spot or perhaps between two hard spots. But they are going to wrap themselves around a tendon. So for instance, here we're looking at a shoulder joint. This is the head of the humerus. And here we see the scapula or the beginning of our scapula with some muscles coming in. Here's a clavicle, our collarbone, right? And here we see the tendon of our, one of the heads of our biceps brachii. The biceps brachii has two heads. That's why it's called the biceps for two heads. And head is misspelled here clearly. This should say long head spelled like that. <clears throat> so notice that wrapped around the tendon of our biceps brachii, we have a sheath. That tendon, by the way, goes all the way across the head of our humerus to then go grab onto the very start of our scapula. And so that tendon is literally squished um, in between this hard bone here and then softer material uh, of the arm. And to prevent too much rubbing and friction, we have a tendon sheath that wraps around the tendon there. So that leaves us with the menisci. And for this, let's take a look at a superior view of our knee joint. So we've, we've removed the femur, and we're looking here 
at, on this side, the side with the bigger bone, this would be our tibia. And here we have the much smaller bone that would be the side for the fibula. Notice that we have a C-shaped structure here and a C-shaped structure there. Those are the different menisci. So we talk about the medial meniscus because the tibia actually sits medially, the shin bone, and the lateral meniscus. And once again, notice the crossing of the various ligaments, the ACL and the PCL, which also provides stability to our knee joint. Now we can further classify the synovial joints into these six smaller groups. And these smaller groups are created based on the articular surfaces of the meeting bones. And I'm just going to visit a couple of these synovial joints. I will expect that you study the rest on your own. I have also added really great little videos on my YouTube channel that uh, cover each one of these joint types with images that are three-dimensional so that you can really clearly visualize how they work and why they're called what they're called. So let's go over the example of a pivot joint. A great example of a pivot joint occurs between our first and second vertebra. So our first vertebra is called the atlas. So the atlas is cervical vertebra one, while the axis is cervical vertebra two. And you can easily remember this by thinking of the mythical figure atlas. What does he do? He carries the big world on his shoulder, right? So the atlas is our first vertebra um, because that first vertebra carries our big head, right? Now the axis gets its name because it actually has a bone marking that sticks out like this, as I draw right here, and fits nicely in an opening in the atlas. So this tooth-like structure of the axis, um, which I'm labeling C2 for the axis, fits inside of an opening of our atlas, which is C1 to the point that the axis can easily rotate. And this is what allows our head to move from our left shoulder to our right shoulder and back. And of course, we can just easily say that it's a movement that allows us to say no. Which is different, by the way, from the joint that allows us to say yes, because that involves the joint the synovial joint between our atlas and our occipital bone. So let's take a look at the hinge joint. And the hinge joint is very much like what it says. It looks like the hinge of a door. If you look at how the um, elbow of our arm is put together, then certainly how the ulna articulates that is this bone here, the pinky bone, how it articulates with our humerus is very much like a hinge joint. And as I said, I hope that you guys can learn the other ones. Certainly the ball and socket joints are very easy for you to understand and they're illustrated right here, or it is illustrated right there. So that wraps up our discussion of our synovial joints as well as our other types of joints we discussed in the previous video. So for the remainder of this video, we're going to talk just very briefly about arthritis. As the name says, arthritis means inflammation of the joints. Remember that arth always means joints. And anytime you see a prefix that ends in itis, it always refers to inflammation. This is a very common disease that we see in the world, and there are many different kinds of arthritis. So just because a person says, I have arthritis, it does not mean one kind. It does typically refer to the most common kind, 
which is called osteoarthritis. But in general, what we find is that this joint disease leads to pain in the joints, often along with stiffness and swelling. So osteoarthritis is the most common form of chronic arthritis and is much more prominent in females than in males. And most of us develop it. The majority of us already start forming osteoarthritis as teenagers when we're athletic and we're doing perhaps a lot of running or playing football or we're playing tennis or we're dancing ballet. All of these extra impacts on our bones and our joints start to wear out our, jones, our bones and this is a perfectly normal process. So if we were to look at the joints of an athlete, uh, the, the joints of a young athlete, we would see that there's already a little bit of wear and tear there, uh, the very beginnings of osteoarthritis. So this is a very normal aging process. And what does it entail? Well, let's take a look at, at a picture. Let's say we're looking at a hip joint. So right here we see how the head of the femur nicely fits into that cavity of our hip bone, right? And the head of the femur has a nice glassy layer of hyaline cartilage called the articular cartilage. Well, when we use our joints a lot, that cartilage is going to start to wear out and we might see little pits here and there in the cartilage initially, and through time it could wear out or wear off almost completely to the point that the patient will be rubbing bone against bone, and that's when it gets really, really painful. Now, as mentioned in the previous slide, there are many kinds of arthritis and the two other kinds that I'd like for you to be aware of are rheumatoid arthritis, which is a um, rheumatoid arthritis, hard to spell while you're talking, also abbreviated as RA. This, unfortunately, is an autoimmune disease, and therefore it's difficult to treat. It's a pretty devastating and crippling disease, and it tends to be um, impacting females more than males, most likely because it's an autoimmune disease. It seems that autoimmune diseases tend to impact females more often than males. And then we also have gout, or you can call it gouty arthritis, which can create a lot of havoc. This, on the other hand, is more prominent in males than in females. Now, in rheumatoid arthritis, what is the problem there? We see inflammation of the synovial membrane, which causes the membrane to thicken and therefore literally makes it very difficult for the bones to move properly. In gouty arthritis, we see that uric acid crystals deposit inside of particular joints especially, um, such as the big toe joint, um, very common. Now this used to be called something like the rich man's disease in the old days, and that is because kings, for instance, had the opportunity to eat lots of red meat, and red meat leads to the formation of much more uric acid that then had the opportunity to get deposited into the king's joints, especially his big toes, and it's very painful. Uh, drinking too much alcohol and various other things can trigger it as well. So it can be somewhat diet controlled, um, but it's also again a form of arthritis that's not extremely, extremely well understood. And so this is the end of the joints. Thanks for watching, you guys. I hope you learned something. Bye.